Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Near Shepherd in San Juanito County in Texas, one evening, a friend and I were riding my ATV through the Sam Houston National Forest while riding down a straight and rather wide trail approximately 20 yards wide. I turned around to say something to my friend who was riding as passenger. When I turned back around, there was a large humanoid creature approximately six to six and a half feet tall, broad shouldered and thick in appearance with either dark brown or black hair covering its entire body. It spooked me, and I yelled at my passenger to look. When I yelled, the creature turned and ran into the woods. The creature made a quick turn upright and ran upright. This marks out the possibility of being a bear. My friend did not see it and asked what I was yelling about. I could not speak from awe. The creature was only approximately 40 to 50 yards in front of us in the wide open. I sped up the ATV to the location where the creature ran into the wood line. The limbs and brush were shaking back and forth, but I did not see him again due to the thick underbrush East Texas is known for. It scared me at first, and I downshifted the ATV as fast as possible and sped away stopping several hundred yards down the trail to explain to my friend what I had just seen. It was an experience I will never forget, and who knows, maybe it was meant just for me to see. I have told many people this story, most laugh, but I know what I saw. I am an avid hunter, I respect all wildlife, and have a lot of experience in the field of wildlife. There is nothing else it could have been. Like I said before, I had a clear 40 to 50 yard sighting of this creature. It was midday to early evening. The weather was clear and the visibility was good due to midday hours. It was mostly dense pine forest. There are many creeks in the area where I observed this creature. On to the next one. I had purchased a framed copy of Thomas Moran's painting, The Golden Gate. It was painted in 1893, depicting an area of Yellowstone National Park 22 years after Moran had visited the area as a member of the Hayden Expedition of 1871. It depicts a magnificent view, looking down through the canyon with the river flowing below and the fall cascading in the distance. For years, I stood and stared at this painting on my living room wall in an attempt to experience what Moran had so many years before. I thought about the hardships they must have endured, and yet, out of everything, this magnificent masterpiece had emerged, which to me proved that adversity fuels greatness. This is, after all, the way in which a diamond is formed from a common lump of coal after having been placed under great pressure for many years. I had often thought about visiting the location in the painting for myself to experience firsthand that which had inspired Moran to paint such a masterpiece. After much planning and saving, the day came that I found myself hiking into Yellowstone, heading toward the very same area where Moran's inspiration had been sparked in June. At 11 o'clock in the morning, I was standing with a photograph of the painting in hand in the very spot where Moran had stood. It was a rugged hillside tucked in between two adjacent mountains, with the valley having been cut by the river's waters over millions of years. Surrounding me and below me, just as Moran had painted it, were gigantic boulders of every shape and size with scrubby pines growing both in and around, and through them on the slope. It was a magnificent sight to behold. I could smell the river, the stones, the soil around me, and I paused to ponder those men who had seen this for the first time 
in 1871. This tract of land, as well as the land west of the Mississippi, had been acquired by President Thomas Jefferson in 1803, in a deal that had been struck between him and Napoleon France. On my right-hand side was basically a sheer rock face, with a trail cut through it about midway, the entirety of it being devoid of any plant life. To my left-hand side was a similar rock face, which had a somewhat rounded top covered in mostly pines, the sides of which sloped down midway to meet the river's edge. This side had a tremendous amount of tree growth associated with it throughout. I had been sitting in this area for well over two hours, being in no hurry whatsoever to leave, when I saw two darkly colored figures coming up the slope to my left, ascending from the river in the valley below. They appeared as two black ants would crawling across tan-colored sand, the slope on which they were moving, having no plant life on it whatsoever, allowed me to see their outline perfectly. As I put my binoculars on them, the distance was still too great for me to see with great clarity, but one was taller than the other. And they were both walking on two legs. The creatures were climbing a slope, which had to be a 60 degree incline, and were doing so rapidly without the aid of any walking poles or the like. This slope had to be several hundred yards or better, after which it met with a sheer cliff of some 200 feet, which was crowned with trees. I could tell as I watched them that their arms and their legs were abnormally long, as compared to their torsos. They were taking what I would call very long and athletic strides in human standards. As they ascended the slope, when they had reached this cliff, where the grade changed from, say, 60 degrees to vertical, the creatures began to scale the rock wall like two spiders. There was no break or a spite taken by either of them in doing so. They had just ascended a very steep slope at a record pace and were now scaling a sheer rock face at a rate that didn't seem humanly possible. The reality was that they were not human. Exactly what they were at the time, I could not say. They appeared to be the coloration of a chocolate Labrador dog. Without the aid of any climbing gear whatsoever, these creatures scaled this cliff face with the ease of walking up a flight of stairs. I was mesmerized as I watched them. The creature who had taken the lead on the climb, having reached the top, simply stood up and walked into the tree, with the second following shortly thereafter. Looking back, I now realized that I was watching two Bigfoot. It made me wonder if Moran and the expedition crew hadn't run into the same in 1871. I guess with magnificent landscape comes magnificent creatures, and I had just seen two of them. The most incredible aspect of this sighting was the strength and athleticism exhibited by these creatures. What they accomplished in a matter of 10 minutes would have taken experienced hikers and climbers hours. This entire sighting was the icing on the cake as far as my journey was concerned. It was a day that I will never forget. On to the next one. For decades, tales of mysterious people inhabiting the deep woods of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park have persisted. These range all the way from reports of hairy wild men to entire families or groups of feral cannibals. For some conspiracy theorists, these wild feral people are said to account for the unexplained disappearances in the national park. In particular, they have been blamed for the disappearance of young Dennis Martin, the six-year-old boy who vanished near the Cade Cove area in June of 1969. Even retired park ranger and legendary tracker Dwight McCarter, who was the lead in the Dennis Martin disappearance and many others during his long career, admits that there were wild men who lived deep within the recesses of the National Park. Some claim that these wild men 
are in fact the cryptic creature also known as Bigfoot. There have been Bigfoot sightings throughout the whole of the Appalachia, so if the creature does indeed exist, the Great Smokies Natural Park would be the perfect area for them to inhabit. The Cherokee have legends and stories of these hairy giants who were already inhabitants of the land before the Cherokee came into the area thousands of years ago. Other people claim that these wild men, some say there are women and children too, are not Bigfoot at all, but rather inbred and untamed humans who have lived their entire lives deep in the woods. They dress in animal skins, hunt and forage for their food, build their own settlements, and so on. Naturally, they don't take kindly to strangers and have been known to kill any interlopers who dare to enter their secret domain, whether by accident or design, and they have been known to eat them as well. Yes, that correct. The rumors and legends and tales from the dark hills and hollers of the Great Smoky Mountains, as well as other parts of Appalachia, are not only isolated, inbred, and demented, they lean towards cannibalism as well. Although the average person will tell you that this is preposterous and there's no way humans, even wild, hairy, inbred ones who have the occasional craving for human flesh, could hide out in the mountains undetected. I counter with this. Have you ever been to the Smokies? Now, I'm not talking about Gatlinburg or any of the touristy areas. I'm not even talking about the myriad of trails that run through the park which are hiked by millions of hikers every year. I'm talking about deep in the woods, really deep. There are places off trail that it's possible no human has ever set foot, not even the settlers or the Cherokee or possibly even Bigfoot. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park covers over half a million acres. Let that number settle in. Half a million 522,427 acres to be exact, as per the National Park Service website. Unless you've been in the deep woods, there are no trails, no markers, no anything other than you and the forest. It's almost impossible to comprehend just how vast this wilderness is indeed. The ruggedness of the National Park, which sits on the border of eastern Tennessee, and western North California. In fact, it's almost divided evenly between the two states, has to be experienced to be believed. It's in these giant old-growth forests that you begin to realize just how small and infinitesimal a person is compared to the wilderness. It's no wonder people die out here, especially those who are ill-equipped and ill-prepared. All that to say is that there are plenty of places, an almost innumerable number of places, that a person or even a group of people could hide out for an indefinite amount of time. If you had the basic rough necessities, food, water, shelter, which are in abundance here, if you know what you're doing, there would be no reason to ever leave those woods. Case in point, Eric Robert Rudolph, also known as the Olympic Park Bomber, successfully hid out in the Nanthahala National Forest, which is 533,000 acres expanse of wilderness in western North Carolina and along the Appalachian Trail headed toward the Great Smokies. Rudolph managed to elude the FBI for five years and was only caught in 2003 because he left the forest and was rummaging through a trash dumpster in Murphy, North Carolina, where he was spotted by a rookie police officer who recognized him from the FBI 10 most wanted list. If this man with only minimal survival skills managed five years, imagine the skills of someone who has never left these woods in their entire lives. As a possibility, it must be considered. Cases like this, hearing rumors even of the wild men and cannibals, families of people living like this their whole lives, make me question our very humanity as a species. Did society and what the majority consider socially normal or acceptable tame us and take away our very instincts and our human nature? At their base, feral humans 
are simply people who have grown up and lived their entire lives without outside human contact. Let's take a closer look at these alleged sightings of these wild and feral people and communities, which seem to be springing up more and more in recent years, or at the very least, taking the blame for what's been going on with these missing clusters. Though our focus is the Great Smokies, these communities and lone people are all over the world, in all the deepest forests and woods. Sometimes they are even raised by animals, mainly wolves, and are therefore without any kind of human instincts to speak of. No morals, the morals of a wild beast, a feral animal who will attack at the scent of a human and or their blood. And this is most likely why these people are being blamed for many of the missing clusters. One of the earliest reported accounts of a feral human is the somewhat obscure tale of a bizarre individual who came to be known as Wild Peter. In 1724, in Germany, some men were hunting deep in the woods. What they were hunting for has been lost to time and retelling, but what they came upon that day has never been forgotten. Imagine how startled and surprised these men were when, out of some deep and thick woods, emerged a small boy. He was on all fours like an animal, and at first was only recognized by the men as a naked, brownish, black-haired creature. The men were astonished and tried their best to coax the wild boy out of the thicket so they could capture him. But all attempts failed, and the lad turned and ran at an inhuman speed back into the depths of the forest. The boy was estimated to be about 12 years old, and when the men reported what they had seen, they found they weren't the only ones who had seen this boy creature. He had been a haunt to the area for a long time, and was even known to climb trees with the ease of a bear, though he snarled and growled and walked on all fours like a wolf. The child was eventually captured by another group of hunters and brought to King George himself who was already visiting the area. The king was fascinated by the child, who was partially fond of eating raw vegetables and meat, who had no concept or knowledge of speech, and who seemed to love to tear apart and devour live birds. King George loved the little creature boy and named him Peter. He was shipped off to England to be studied by the best and most well-respected academics. The thing about Peter, though, was that he was also a pickpocket, how did he learn this behavior? He wouldn't eat bread or anything cooked and abhorred being bathed. Cases of Wild Peter just show that this has been going on most likely since the dawn of time. With technology, it's just becoming harder to hide. It's becoming harder for these lone people or their communities to stay off the radar. On July 13, 1973, a seasonal National Park ranger named Charles Hugh had a violent encounter with what is known as the Wild Man of Catalucci. While checking up on fishermen looking for licenses, he encountered a large man with a heavy beard and a fly rod. Hughes asked for the man's name and whether or not he had a fishing license. The man replied, I've got no name. I've lived in these woods all my life. When he asked about the fishing license, the man reached into his jacket and pulled out a pistol. Though the ranger managed to disarm the man during a scuffle, he wasn't able to fully subdue him. As Hughes tried to drive off in his jeep to get assistance in detaining the man, a giant rock was thrown through the jeep window. Hughes was able to get to a nearby station for backup, and a large group of rangers and volunteers used bloodhounds and tracked the wild man well into the night. They were never able to find any trace of him. Subsequently, a popular song came out of the encounter and, of course, much discussion and speculation about this encounter came out in public through the press. This story and many more live on and have been added to and exaggerated upon to this very day. Despite these additions to the story, the fact remains the same. These men and children, even women, do exist, and they are seemingly very dangerous to encounter. There is another side to all of this as well. Thus far, we have been talking about the feral and wild people who have lived their entire lives in the wilderness and have no idea of civilization, some of whom are even taken in and raised by wild and deadly animals. This seems to defy Mother Nature herself, but 
What about the people who choose to live off-grid and purposely set out to live wild and possibly feral? There are so many reports, especially in recent years, of encounters with these wild and or feral men. Does the ease in which they are able to accomplish this and their ability to just slip into this life of no contact with humanity and no creature comfort or worldly pleasures just show us we are one step, maybe even one accidental flip from being this way in the first place? Is wild and feral living what humanity was really made for? The concept of people choosing to live this way is something most of us can't even fathom, yet it fascinates us nonetheless, fascinates and terrifies us. Jeff Holland has a rather famous account of his encounter with a feral human in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, which he describes in detail it happened right near Cloudbitter Rock in 1990. The author says he encountered a white male in his mid to late 30s, naked, but for being covered in leaves, mud, and vines. These were also matted into his hair and beard, both of which were filthy and unkempt. As much of the young man's appearance was, Holland described the man as having an absurd, swamp thing appearance. The wild man's walk was ape-like and hunched over. After maintaining eye contact for what seemed like an eternity, the ape-like, feral man turned and ran off into the depths of the woods and forest. This brought up an interesting thought. Is this how they're able to kidnap and stalk humans so easily? Thinking about the description of both the Jeff and many others have given of these people, it's come to my attention how easily they would just blend into the environment. There's a strong and strange feeling that somehow, if they do not want to be seen, they won't. Of course, one can be caught by surprise every now and then, but the reports are almost always the same with a few exceptions here and there, that they turn and run at an almost inhuman and cat-like speed back into the wilderness from which they came. We must also keep in mind what the Great Smokies were before they became a national park. It was actually a mountain range that was full of mountain communities which were thriving, such as Cades Cove and Catalucci. If you go all the way back to the 1700s, you'll find a very different atmosphere than today. And that's putting it lightly. Hernando de Soto discovered the Cherokee tribes in the Smokies during his 1540 exploration, which brought the European settlers into the area. Those of the Cherokee who didn't want to adapt and conform to European culture of the time were forced to go to Oklahoma, which is what the Trail of Tears is. Fast forward to the early 1900s, and you'll see the people finally start to utilize the beautiful and bountiful resources of the land. They were farming, hunting, raising livestock, and even cutting down trees to build their own homes. Forests then became towns and pastures, none of which you will see there today. As the years went by, families gave way to lumbering. Farming gave way to lumbering. As logging towns began popping up all over the Smokies, inevitably the geography started to transform, and much of the forests had been cleared away, with nothing replanted to grow in their place. At the rate they were clearing and logging, the trees would have become extinct and there would be no national forest like we know today. At least not the Great Smokies. In 1934, Congress and Franklin Roosevelt chartered and dedicated the park to protect it from being cleared and built on anymore. Is it so much of a stretch to believe that some people are more interested in living as our ancestors did in the Smokies back in the 15, 16, and 1700s and so on? If you have an encounter you would like to share, you can reach me by submitting it to the email in the description box down below. Also, if you'd like to send in a physical letter of your encounter or any fan mail, I also have a P.O. box, which you can find in the description box down below. I love just hearing from all of you, so those options are available if you ever feel like reaching me. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!